have up here um, some um, pamphlets that I've prepared about the Seder and the Haggadah specifically. So this is nothing directly to do with Tanakh Kishana, although everything is related. But if you're interested in, in getting one, it's, I just left them up here, so you're welcome to take one. Um, but this morning we are um, concluding the first non-Torah book that we're encountering in Tanakh Kishana, the book of Yehoshua, of Joshua. Uh, to me, it's very exciting uh, to uh, look at a book like this. Um, and um, one of the reasons is that in the book of Joshua, there is a record of the landmarks of the sections of Eretz Israel, of the land of Israel, that were being apportioned to the various tribes. Some people might say, well, you know, that's kind of boring, just like lists of names in the Torah. Sometimes uh, people skip over it. But to me, it's uh, a kind of um, uh, exciting artifact of reality that existed and has been preserved for centuries and that we still have the opportunity to relate to uh, today. But first of all, let me um, uh, offer this map um, which um, I, I, I distributed once before, so you might already have a copy of this. So what I'll do is I'm going to just allow uh, everybody who wants to take one to take one and, and just please return to me whatever's left over and so I can uh, use them in the future. Actually, Anne, if you need at least one copy. So, <laughs> okay. 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 so on this map, um, I'll, I guess I'll give you a chance to distribute it. Um, just to orient ourselves, uh, there are all kinds of routes that are shown here, but if you can find the Dead Sea, okay, um, uh, it might help you uh, because the country of Moab is so conspicuous in its lettering here. If you find that, that's on the southeastern mm -hmm. shore of the Dead Sea. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's the Dead Sea. And the crossing over the uh, Jordan River, the Jordan River is very um, um, light on this map, but you can see it north of the Dead Sea. And then if you look at the city of Jericho, do you all see that? Yeah. And so that's where the crossing of the, of the uh, Jordan River took place. That's where Joshua led the Israelites into, into Israel. And some of the uh, theories based upon the book of Joshua of the route of conquest are shown there as well. For example, if you uh, go from Jericho uh, west, uh, northwest, you'll come to the town of Ai, A-I. Okay? So we'll talk a little bit about Ai. And then also, go back now to Jericho, and southeast of Jericho, you'll see Gilgal. Gilgal is where Jer uh, Joshua's camp encampment remained for many years. Eventually, it was uh, it was moved to Shiloh. If you find Shiloh, go go west of Jericho, and then there's a dotted line that brings you up to Shiloh. Okay, so so these are some of the prime uh, towns, prime locations, uh, you know that we that we have. Um, the the land that that Joshua and and the people found was already inhabited. No, there's no secret about that. It was inhabited by various tribes, which we sort of generally call Canaanite tribes. Seven tribes are mentioned explicitly as having been already in residence in the land and being um, candidates for being driven out or exterminated. I'm using these words very, very uh, uh, openly. Um, um, place it, uh, um, tribes like the um, Girgashites and the Jebusites and the, um, uh, well, I may not remember all of them, but the, the Amorites. The, the, the um, so most of the people that, that Joshua encountered initially were actually Amorites. Now, um, there is a uh, statement from the Talmud that you'll find in your outline if you look at uh, number two, 
uh, in, your, in your Joshua outline. Um, somebody uh, want to read that statement? It's from the um, tractate Midarim. Now this is a little bit difficult to uh, to understand. What do you think the sin? What sin do you think he was referring to? That they didn't go into Canaan. Mm -hmm. Well, by default, we we often think of the calf. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that would be the, the golden calf. Perhaps that was the sin. Uh, perhaps the sin was that they were. Uh, I heard somebody say it was an animal up here that. They um, were reluctant to go into the land. You know, that's another possibility. But whatever he's referring to, it's a little bit hard to know. Whatever he's referring to, um, he seems to say that the prime books of the Bible are the five books of Moses and Joshua. Now, there's an interesting corroboration of that from outside of Judaism because there is a group. Um, uh, that still exists in small numbers and live in the area of Israel who are known as uh, in Hebrew Shomronim or in English Samaritans. And they are a kind of, um, they, they descend from a kind of amalgam of Jews and non-Jews that apparently um, came into existence when the Northern Kingdom was conquered by the Assyrians, and the populations were mixed up together. And these people observe things that are very similar to Judaism, and they have uh, a scroll that they read from. I don't know exactly how they handle it, but, but they have a scroll just as we have the Torah scroll. But while our Torah scroll has five books, their scroll has six books, and Joshua is the sixth book. They exist today? Yes. I don't know if I visited them once. Um, so, uh, so where were they located? Uh, well, the, where I visited them, they were near Shechem, <coughs> which is the same as Nablus. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. right, so, um, uh, and I think they also lived in, um, there were also some of them, some of their group, I think, also lived in Jordan. Um, and in the, in the other places, too, where they, they, they lived in today. Um, around this time of the year, you often will see a photo in a Jewish periodical of some sort, which shows them uh, sacrificing a lamb, because they they actually have the korbanot, uh, according to the way they interpret it, based upon uh, the photo, the korbanot being the offerings. So, um, sorry, do they have a, do they have a temple? Um, I don't know the specifics of it, but I think that they where they're located uh, would conform with probably one of the temple areas that are mentioned in the Bible, but not, not to research. Okay, so um, the, um, the one, of the, one of our goals today is to try to understand why Joshua the book, is, is held in such a high regard in reference to the five books of Moses, which led um, Ralph Adder to make a statement that he, that he did. Um, the traditional um, author of the book is uh, Joshua himself, except for the very end of it, which is about his death. But interestingly, the very end of the of Devarim, of Deuteronomy, the book of the Torah, is about Moses' death, and that's traditionally attributed to Joshua. So there's a sort of you know trading off at, at the end, you know, that's, that's the parallel here. Um, the um, geographical context, which you know we see to some extent on this map, um, is I, you know I wanted to find just an example in Joshua where the landmarks are um, are you know, presented. So um, if you look, for example. It's chapter 15. Um, beginning with verse 20. Chapter 15, beginning with verse 20. You'll see that 
all of these cities, which presumably existed at the time of the settlement, are mentioned as landmarks, is, you know, uh, to indicate the, the settlements of the various tribes. Because what happened was the land was divided among the tribes. So each tribe took a territory. It's very much like the United States is divided into states, or other countries are divided, like Canada, into provinces, and I'm sure this is true of many other countries. Uh, there is a kind of, of um, ethnic heritage that each of these tribes had in reference to where they would be living. Now, the approach of Joshua is that the tribes were coming into the land from across the Jordan River, and the land, and they would come into the land, they would wipe out the current inhabitants of the land, and they would displace them, and then the land would be um, divided in order to accommodate the various tribes. And there are other maps um, that we'll look at in the future which show how these tribes uh, are presumably settled throughout the land. The, um, which tribe do you think um, got the land that would later contain the capital of Israel. Judah. 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 That's right. That's right. And so that that territory sort of got its name um, after this primary tribe of, of Judah. Uh, and you know also if you look at the, um, the birth record of Jacob's sons, considering that they were born of four different wives, and two of the wives were primary wives, right? You know, Leah and Rachel. And then the other two wives were secondary wives. You can kind of see also that the tribes are arranged, the more remote tribes are, the, generally speaking, the tribes of the secondary wives. So you can see a kind of correspondence there. Um, so Joshua is, um, you know, a kind of, a, among other things, is a record of the, um, the, the land grants to the various to the various tribes. Okay. Let's take a look at the um, um, outline of the book, which is in your in your handouts. Uh, to to become familiar with the structure, it's um, Sefer Yehoshua outline. Mm -hmm. Each of the books has an outline like this, and we've seen this type of outline before. You'll see that, that on, a, on a gross basis, the book is divided into three sections. The first, in Hebrew, we call, we refer to as the kibush. That's the conquest of the land. Um, and then the second section is called the nahala, the division of the land among the tribes, which is largely what I was referring to. And then the very end is a summary of, of the, uh, the history up to that point. Uh, it's, it's, it's presented in the form of a speech that Joshua gives to the, uh, to the people. It ends in some ways in a very similar kind of style that the book of Deuteronomy ends the Torah, with Moses giving a farewell address to the, to the people. Then if you yeah, went this speech. Well, you have to look in the book itself. Oh, well. but, but the speeches were referred to on this, this outline. Oh, okay. Can I see two of them on the mic? Just turn it I see. Okay. Some, some people haven't found it. Yeah. No. I, I hope you oh, have. Oh, you know what? I have it. It's okay. This is it. That's it. You're there. Yeah. In mine, yeah, it uh, actually has page one. Too. It's a terrible book. Um, the middle column, uh, which is entitled uh, Key Events, gets into more detail, almost uh, chapter by chapter, actually, um, of what you know, we find in the book. So we don't have time to go through each of those chapters, but that's for you to, to look at. And we will look at the um, part that's in the middle of the first section, which covers chapter seven and eight, the campaign against I. We'll look at that in a moment. Okay. The chapter six, the fall of Jericho, is probably, I would guess, the most famous universally of, of the book, uh, in which the Israelites surround Jericho and the Kohanim blow on trumpets and the walls 
you know, to use the, the popular, you know, sentence, come tumbling down. And it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a magnificent, you know, kind of image. Um, archaeological work has been done on Jericho and has found that there are times when the city was apparently destroyed. Um, I have no evidence of that it was from trumpets, but the point is that, uh, you know, in those days, cities were often, the archaeological cross sections will show destruction of the city and, and, then, and then something else being built on, on top of it. Um, you'll see some connections with the Torah, some obvious connections with the Torah. For example, look at chapter 20, cities of refuge assigned. The Torah prescribes that there should be places where a manslayer, somebody who is um, not necessarily a murderer, but is fleeing from the practice of blood vengeance where uh, justice was carried out by the family of the victim <coughs> against the assumed perpetrator, where he could find refuge uh, from that um, pursuer. The Torah prescribes these cities. Here we have them being set up. Then in chapter 21, cities for the Be'im assigned amongst various tribes. The Torah also uh, prescribes this, um, that there should be certain cities which, although all the territory, or almost all the territory belonged to a tribe, there were sort of, um, shall we say, um, um, neutral cities, or cities that weren't specifically of that tribe, that were tr cities that were inhabited and apparently run by the Levites. So they were like religious places. You know, throughout. Of course, this brings up the issue of how did that relate to the idea of having a centralized sanctuary in, in Jerusalem. There was a lot of, you know, sort of, um, you know, interesting, conflicting evidence about these kinds of issues throughout these books. But at least we see that, that cities were assigned for the, uh, the Levites. Let's turn now to section five, and I'm skipping things which I understand were already uh, addressed in the previous session on Joshua by Rabbi Hammerman. Um, section five follows after the conquest of Jericho. Now, put yourselves in the position and in the mindset of the Israelites after the conquest of Jericho. Of course, you have to put yourself in the miraculous context in which this is presented in Joshua. Um, the um, chapter that we will look at is chapter 7, so you might as well open to that right now. start with the first verse. Okay? Do I have a volunteer to read the first verse? The Israelites, however, violated the prescription Achim, son of Kamai, son of Zabdi, son of Zerah, I should have known better, of the tribe <laughs> of Judah, took of that which was proscribed, and the Lord was incensed with the Israelites. Okay. So the word is proscribed, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, the, um, anybody know what the Hebrew word is? If, if you, have, you have your Hebrew and English books, it'll be in there. The Hebrew word for something that is proscribed property starts with a chet. Terra. It's a terra. Have you ever heard the word terra? And that's true also in uh, traditional, very traditional Jewish practice 
if somebody does something that is, um, you know, an egregious sin, like they open up their store on the second day of Yanta, uh, they might be put in care. Okay, so um, the um, is that like exile? It's a kind it's of kind of um, internal exile. Okay, but that's not what's that, and it, and and the idea sort of descends from this. But that's not what this is. This is the rule that because the wars that the Israelites were waging against the inhabitants of the land were divinely sponsored wars and were meant to rid the land of the sinful inhabitants that preceded them. Everything that is the result of that war, including all the possible spoils, were in Haran. They were proscribed. You were not allowed to use them. They had to be completely destroyed. So that's not just the people, but also the property. So what happened here is that Ahan used the harem. He took some of the harem. That's that's highly prohibited. Okay. So no rape and plunder. Okay. So that's the first place. Now, take a look and now at the at verses uh, two through uh, nine. I will summarize them. Um, they now turn from Jericho and go to Ah. And the advice of the scouts is, you know, you don't, we don't, Joshua, you don't have to send too many people to Ah. You know, look at how successful we were in Jericho, and I is much smaller. You know, they took basically a casual attitude about it. And the result was that they suffered a defeat, a terrible defeat. So they were um, disappointed, embarrassed, humiliated, and that's the initial message that the encounter with I sets up. Okay. Now, then we turn to the next verse, which is verse ten. All right. So. Did somebody volunteer to read verse 10? And we'll go on a little bit further to Mary. Um, but the Lord answered Joshua, Arise, what you are trusting. Israel has sinned. They have broken the covenant by which I bound them. They have taken up the prescribed and put it in their vessels. They have stolen. They have broken faith. Therefore, the Israelites will not be able to hold their ground against their enemies. They will have to turn tail before their enemies, for they have become proscribed. I will not be with you anymore unless you root out from among you what is proscribed. Okay. Um, and um, the usual response to a tactical setback in war is what? Today. Think of what happened to Israel um, on Yom Kippur in 1973. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and what does the committee generally come up with? A new strategy. And isn't it usually a some sort of military yeah. reason? Mm -hmm. yeah. What's the reason here? In this, it's, 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 it has it's nothing to do with the military facts, except very, very, you know, indirectly. Mm -hmm. And now let's see how how the um, solution is um, applied. Uh, somebody like to read the beginning of verse thirteen. Order them, purify yourselves for tomorrow. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, something proscribed is in your midst. O Israel, 
and you will not be able to stand up to your enemy until you have purged the first scribe from among you. Okay, now let's skip now to uh, verse 16 where Joshua carries out this um, prescription. Okay. Sure. Early next morning, Joshua had Israel come forward by five, and the tribe of Judah was indicated. He then had the clans of Judah come forward. Okay, so you get the picture? Yeah. Mm -hmm. All the other tribes are off the hook now. Right. Now they concentrate on Judah. Okay. He then had the clans of Judah come forward, and the clan of Zerah was indicated. Okay, so that's why you have to read through all of the names, all of the other names of, of, of um, his, uh, his family, okay? Then he had the clan of Zerah come forward by ancestral houses, and Zabdi was indicated. Finally, he had his ancestral, ancestral house come forward, man by man, and Achan, son of Zerah, son of Zabdi, of the tribe of Judah, was indicated. So this is a very dramatic kind of, uh, you know, um, series of, um, of investigations. It'd be great on the stage. Um, I, I don't know, somebody must have written an opera based on this. But it is, it's, it is um, uh, obviously uh, set up this way for a purpose. What's the purpose? What's, why, why would it be set up in such a dramatic way? to make it clear who was uh, to be punished, who was the one who sinned, mm -hmm. and um, no question, and to embarrass him mm -hmm. in front of everybody. And this, uh, this continues the type of approach that we see in the Torah, where, I mean, you can really only, I think, understand this and appreciate it if you accept the idea that these are being related as miraculous events. Right? And, and so here, there is a, another miracle happening. It's, it's a miracle which is going to lead to punishment because um, um, the, the wrongdoer is, um, is sort of coaxed by Joshua to confess and, and then he's executed. So, so uh, the whole point here, the whole point here seems to be to show that there is um, a kind of collective responsibility, but that it's not that, the, not that the group is necessarily responsible for what the individual did, but when one individual sins, it has an effect upon the entire group. So they, they um, experienced a defeat at I. It should have been a victory based upon everything else that had happened. And you could say, well, maybe they were overly confident, which is the way I would see it, when I said that initially. And yet, the uh, Joshua, the book of Joshua, doesn't really you know, say that so, so strongly, but rather it, it sort of connects these two things that we would never think had anything to do with each other. And it says it's because there's some sort of underlying disequilibrium, moral disequilibrium, some underlying transgression against the principle of harem that this one man apparently secretly had violated and that undermined the entire enterprise and so something has to be done to demonstratively root him out and make him apparently you know, responsible among the people. And the whole divine way of doing this is meant to show that God is watching and, and you know, your success will depend on, on what each of you individually does. So you would prefer to find some sort of um, naturalistic explanation for this? Uh, 
Doesn't he supposedly God knows everything? I'm troubled by saying that he was killed. Life is so precious. Why can't we view it he made a mistake? Uh, well, he did. He made a mistake. I mean, you know, we're human. We make mistakes all the time. Uh, for those mistakes, should we be killed or should we get, be given some kind of punishment with opportunity to, uh, you know, make amends? Uh, this killing, you know, in the name of God, just drives me crazy. Well, God does it okay. with love. Right. Well, I mean, I'm just, I now, are the whole you thing just. Are you troubled by the death penalty for treason? Yeah. Okay. Well, so that's consistent. Yeah. Some, <laughs> people, some people aren't. Some people well. see uh, a, a treacherous person as a person who is, who is causing, potentially, and sometimes really, the death of you know, many, many mm -hmm. people of his own, you know, his, own uh, nation, his own nation. You know? Well, I guess I'm against capital punishment because yeah. it just covers everything. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Well, by the way, I mean, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not necessarily, um, um, you know, advocating capital right. punishment no. here, but I am trying, to, but I think it's an important question, and I'm trying to, you know, understand uh, why, you know, we have all these capital punishments. Um, someone did research and found that if you, if you subtract all of the sins which are punished by death in the Torah, that are ritualistic sins, you know, like not observing the Sabbath, you know, things of that nature, that actually Jewish or Hebraic law, you know, Israelite law, would have one of the lowest rates of capital punishment compared to that of other other nations. Yes. Uh, so this is in that category. So, so, so then the question is, so why? What's, what, whether you, you know, ultimately are going to approve it or disapprove it, but can you understand some purpose, some reason, you know, for that, for having the death penalty? I mean, there was a man uh, described in the Torah who went out and gathered wood on Shabbat. And um, he was, he was, uh, he was stoned to death. He was killed. Yes, to dissuade other people from doing it. Well, maybe. Yes? And I, I would just offer, alongside both of these ideas, which I, I think are you know, uh, certainly seem uh, valid, um, that um, when you are dealing with um, rules that in some ways are arbitrary, you know, for example, uh, the rule against not taking another, an innocent life doesn't seem arbitrary. It's not going into a whole discussion about it at the moment. For most people, it doesn't seem arbitrary. It just seems to be some sort of you know, um, the universal natural reason for prohibiting murder, you know, and, and therefore the death penalty for murder is sort of seems like an, an a, 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 a punishment that fits the crime, whether whether you, you might not advocate capital punishment, by the way, I don't, but the point is trying to understand the Torah um, on its, you know, basic level. Um, but when you get into things that are more arbitrary, like, like, you know, not doing certain things on a particular day of the week, 
and um, you know not taking some of the property which you know uh, could be put to good use you know you know by by you know the conquering people then in a way the ultimate penalty makes some sense because the only justification for these rules is God's fiat. It's that God said so. Mm -hmm. So God gives life and God can take life. So it's up to God to decide. So I'm just offering that as a possible way of understanding it on its, on its own. On its so, okay, so we see that, that um, at least he allow in Exodus when they left that they got all the uh, jewelry and gold from many of the Egyptians. Yes. yes. So he. Yeah, so this is a different approach here. It's definitely a different approach, and maybe uh, for because the set of circumstances are different. Um, because the um, the wealth of the Egyptians that the Israelites <laughs> took wasn't the result of a mitzvah to destroy the Egyptians. When they were enslaved, supposedly the Egyptians took their wealth. Mm -hmm. So this was a kind of a return of their, yeah. of their wealth. Yeah. Okay, so um, this is one of the most um, uh, conspicuous examples of the idea that what one person does has an effect upon the nation, and the nation's success in conquering the land and in staying on the land is determined not by the usual kind of material military considerations, but rather their, their more long-term obedience to God's law. Um, and that translates into the idea that uh, we are entitled to the land of Israel um, only insofar as we observe the covenant for somebody uh, so for many uh, the, um, the following uh, you know, parts of the book deal with um, you know, the conquests of different parts of the land. But I did want to call your attention to a, a highlight which is often referred to and actually represented in art but, uh, Marcia, you had something you wanted to ask. Yeah, and they did. Now they're cleaned up. They did. They, yeah, they, that's uh, it. they paid the price. That's that right. was the price. Uh, that's right. And and uh, the uh, the um, the moral um, you know roadblock was removed. You know, and um, and then they were successful mm -hmm. in taking on. I just want to remind you back for when Rabbi Gala was here. I remember he talked about the fact that. Um, the book of Joshua and the prophets are also about creating this um, moral situation, right? That the, that the God is putting God, the first book, Joshua is about God conquering the world, God, and, and that God is helping us conquer, and then the other one is talk, and then the book of Judges is talking about how we have to work within each other. And that we had to shift from we're marching from we're marching to having this relationship with God in a different way, and the con and that the Book of Joshua is kind of showing that transition in that relationship with God. Okay, um, I wanted also to uh, just to point out in chapter ten, verses ten through verses twelve through fourteen. Chapter ten, uh, verses twelve through fourteen. Um, there is a victory here, um, um, and at the sort of at the at the end of it, 
Um, the, um, this battle against some of the Amorites. In verse 12, Joshua spoke to uh, the Lord on the day that the Lord delivered the Amorites before the children of Israel. And he said before the eyes of Israel, Sun stands still at Gibeon, and moon in the valley of Ireland. Then the sun stood still, and the moon stopped, until the people took retribution against their enemies. Chapter 10, verse 12, beginning with verse 12. Okay, so this is another little miracle. What's the meaning of it? What do you, what do you get from it? It's God still involved in this. That's act. right, that's right. That there is so much to do, and many of these things can only be done while there's daylight. Uh, in order to allow time to do it, they, you know, God essentially lengthened the day. And so this, this image of the sun standing still is often depicted as an example you know, of, of the whole miraculous nature of the, of the conquest. Could it have been a full moon, which would have also given you that? Right, but then, then so what? You know, now it's, now it's, if it was just a natural thing. Well, that seems to me the idea here is to show that, you know, that God is in charge and that God is allowing these things to happen. Look, I don't know what your response was but, uh, to the Six-Day War, but um, I, you know, I observed it. I mean, I was safe in this country, but I observed it, and I don't know. I, I think it's very difficult to explain it just by natural events. I mean, imagine you could. I guess you could. I don't know. But the point is that this was, a, you know, in the, in the whole context of the anxiety with which we were, you know, watching what what the United Nations was doing, not doing, and Nasser was doing it, and then, you know, to have this, this type of unanticipated victory in six days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, the whole thing, you know, mm -hmm. and then it's 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 just something like that. It is. And that's what I was thinking as you were talking about this. Do people think that we have the problems with the Palestinians and Israel There are definitely people who think that the There are definitely, there is definitely a... Then there's no help. <laughs> no, 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 but, but I'm just saying is, you're, you're asking me, is there a right. group of right. people, but I mean, are there people who, who, who believe that way? That way? Yes. And my no answer to you is, is I believe that there are people who believe that way. Do I believe that the entire Kal Yisrael believes that way? No. Yes, no. But I do believe that there are people I do know that there are people who say, right, if we, and, and I, and I, and it may be not even, I think even then there's a subset of those people who say, look, there's ritual and then there's moral stuff, right? And there are people within that that says that we're, we're not doing so great on the moral, forget the ritual. And if we were more, a more light unto the nation, we would be better. And then there are the people who say that if we were, if we're not doing what we're doing, but in that, in our big tent, there are def there is definitely a table um, who's eating at that. Ta there are definitely people eating at that table. Do you ever wonder about that yourself? Mm -hmm. In other words, not what other people are thinking, but for yourself, whether there's some sort of underlying moral um, construct that has to be put in order in order for uh, the Jewish people to succeed. Well, you look for them to be more, the Jewish people, to tend to be more moral. At least you have some hopes, and you're really upset when things show up. I know when my grandmother used to say, that front page has a Jewish name on it. She was very, very upset. Shanda, right. Well, that seems to be connected to the, to the idea of, you know, there's certain certain responsibility that we have. It, it, shouldn't see. I, 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 I don't think that way, because if I did, I'd have no hope. Mm -hmm. To live without hope, um, for me, is too painful. So you think it's hopeless to expect that the Jewish people 
could get its Mara house in order? Yes. Yes. Why? 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 Because I think that um, as human beings, we, um, we have a very, very long way to go in being able to do that. As I think there are people that do it. I think that there are people who work all the time so they get much closer. I don't think that as a people, enough of us are even on the path. To, if that's a requirement, that explains all of our service <laughs> for all of these years. But what I hear you saying is that it's not because we are <coughs> Jews in particular, it's because we're human beings. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So you don't see any special hope possibility, um, talent, uh, vocation for Jews to be Mara more than uh, other people in general. Yeah. I think we are all created in the image of God and whether we observe Judaism or some other religion. Uh, and we all have the potential to be Mara and to... How, how far back does that view go? in your family. In other words, do you think your grandparents thought that way? Uh, it would be very hard, uh, probably not, but it would be very hard for me to say that. And I think maybe my grandmother didn't think that way, and my grandfather did, if, if it was. But I wasn't, um, although I was, you know, in my 20s when my grandmother died, it wasn't a conversation I ever had right. with her. Okay, I'm not even sure she could understand it in English. I just asked you to imagine it, you know, based upon what I yes, I, I, yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of people today who think that Jews are different mm -hmm. and, and can versus other people. Can. Okay. Okay. Let's uh, let's um, kind of move not away from this, but we're kind of going to come back to it at the end. Mm -hmm. But I just want to um, focus on. Uh, if you go look at the outline again, just to be aware of the order of the um, Nahala of the settlement. Um, uh, in verse, in chapter 13, if you look again at the outline of the chapters, chapter 13, we have God, Uvain, and, ha and half of Menashe take the settlement first. They go on the other side of the Jordan, east of the Jordan. You might remember that they were tribes that had established themselves east of the Jordan River, kind of in the area that's called Gilead, Gilad, uh, etc. Then after that, in chapters 14 and 15, Yehuda, following the leadership of Kalev, you know, Kalev was Joshua's colleague uh, when the spies came back, when the scouts came back from the uh, looking at the land in the, in the Torah. Um, they take the area known as Hare Yehuda, the mountains of Judah, in chapters 14 and 15. And then in chapters 16 and 17, the tribes of Ephraim and Menashe take the lands that are known as Shomron or Samaria. Now, the importance of this is that the tribe of Judah is the preeminent tribe of the south, the tribes of Ephraim and Menashe are the preeminent tribes of the north. So I don't know what really figures into this order, but this is the order in which, it, in which it's given, and it probably is not just coincidental. Um, Ephraim, now Judah was um, you know, one of the uh, children of um, Leah, right? Um, and who were Ephraim and Menashe? They were Joseph. Right. They were they were sons of Joseph mm -hmm. and um, and grandsons of, uh, of Rachel. Rachel. Okay. So um, so there's that you know family connection. They show up as being preeminent tribes and they mm -hmm. are taking a uh, an initial stake here in the land. And then um, we see in chapter um, eighteen uh, the moving of the Ohel Moed, which is the same thing, more or less, as the Mishkan, the tabernacle, it moves from Gilgal now to Shiloh. So 
So this is, these are sort of temporary quarters for the Ohel Moed that will eventually end up in Jerusalem, but, but not for a while. And uh, um, it um, um, moves um, a little bit towards the west. Um, some people suggest that the other tribes that have not yet taken their settlement were a bit lazy and reluctant and they stayed in Gilgal and that Joshua was moving the, um, the center of the nation as, as it was, really more like a confederation of tribes, he was moving it to another place to sort of shake up those other tribes and get them moving you know, to, to settle their part of the land. A, a very interesting episode occurs in uh, chapter 22, where Reuben, God, and, Mena and the half, tri half of Menashe, who are on the east part of the uh, Jordan, they build an altar. Um, and the rest of the people are portrayed as being upset with this. I think we can assume that the central authority was upset about it, because if they build an altar, mm, it seems to be in competition with the altar that's presumably at Shiloh. Um, and so um, we don't have time to go into that chapter, but you can read it on your own in chapter 22. There's a kind of peace that's made between um, those, shall I call them, the Eastern tribes and the Western authorities. It's a kind of a peace that's a little bit unbelievable. It's too ideal. But I'm suggesting that just maybe it's set out here in this document in order to sort of testify that everything is okay. That they're doing what they're doing, they're building an altar, but it's, it's, they say the altar is going to be in remembrance, not actually an active altar. Very, very, um, you know, ambiguous. Okay. And don't forget, there's a practical problem. If there is the active altar in Shiloh, that becomes harder to access for the people in the eastern part you know, that are east of the Jordan River. So they may indeed want their own altar. So these are not things that are clearly defined, but you kind of have to read between the lines and get a sense that there was politics, religious politics going on, understandable religious politics, and there's some compromises that were apparently established in order to be able to go forward and not have a war between the tribes and, and significant dissatisfaction uh, uh, on the part of those who were more remote. Doesn't that set up the next stage when they're in Babylonia so that they can have uh, religion and they uh, it's away from Jerusalem? Well, absolutely, you're jumping ahead like in, like by a light year. <laughs> but you're absolutely right. We'll get we'll, we'll, uh, we'll get it, to that. It does so get Jeremiah into Jeremiah is the exponent of that idea. But don't forget, the temple had been destroyed. Right. The but temple's destruction recognizing the tremendous catastrophe that, that that was, is in some ways convenient to allow for religious practices elsewhere in individual cities. But okay. doesn't this sort of set it up in its own way? I think it's a reflection of the ongoing problem of geographic distance. And the idea of having one sanctuary, and only one sanctuary, is in some ways not realistic when you, know, when you consider human nature. Well, and there's a lot of evidence of that in, in uh, the books of um, um, Kings, certainly, and in the book of Judges, I think. Natural rights versus state, yeah. local rights. Right. Okay, <coughs> now um, I call your attention, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, this is number seven in the outline. Uh, to Joshua's final address. Um, and if you want to look at this chapter 24 in Joshua, verses 2 to 4, let's take a look at it. Chapter 24, very close to the end of the book. Last chapter, verses 2 to 4. Would somebody like to read?
Okay, does that remind, does that ring a bell for anybody? Very good, Carol. That's right, I always feel like I just ate some carp <laughs> Okay, that's it. This, that's in the Haggadah. It's a very well-known verse, you know, in that sense that you know, remember in the Haggadah. It comes a little bit after the four sons, that part of the Haggadah. It's the, you know, the two, in the Haggadah, the two versions of explaining, um, you know, why we're doing what we're doing, sort of in response to the four questions. And uh, one is that we were slaves to Pharaoh. Okay? Well, the, where this verse occurs, we just have already read that. This is in the section, the second version of why, you know, of why we do what we do, where we go back not to our being slaves, but even further to our being idolaters. And so that's how this verse figures in, because it goes back to Abraham and Terah before him, who was an idolater. Okay, so um, what's, what is significant here is that you have here kind of a summary of the history. And the core of the Haggadah, by the way, is actually verses taken from Deuteronomy in the Torah, which is another summary of Jewish history as well. So um, it's um, you know well known. Um, Arami obeyed Avi. My father was a wandering Aramean, which is one way of translating. Another way is translating it too, which the Haggadah deals with. So so um, verses like this, you know, have a have a long shelf life, and uh, you know, we, we refer back to them. Um, finally, I guess uh, there is the question which we were already discussing before. Um, we discussed it in a number of different ways. We discussed it on the issue of capital punishment. We discussed it on the issue of is there hope for the Jewish people to be a, a, a truly exemplary moral nation? Um, but the, I suppose the underlying moral question of this book is the very morality of the conquest, you know, of coming in and essentially being told, being endorsed by God to exterminate the um, indigenous population. Okay? Now, in your handout, there's a uh, passage, long passage, from the Rambam, from Maimonides, from his Mishnah Torah. And in it, it's from the uh, part that's called the Kod Melachim, the Laws of Kings. And in it, and by the way, one of the reasons why people refer so much to the Rambam's code, Mishnah Torah, is not because it's supremely authoritative, it really isn't, but because he gave such a succinct, clear, and comprehensive summary of all of the possibilities of Jewish law, including messianic times. And um, everybody likes to go back to it you know, for that, for that reason. It's not necessarily the whole story, but in this case, he says that no matter what basis you have for waging a war under, under Torah law, you always have to offer peace to the nation that you're, that otherwise attack first. Okay? So, you can read it and you can see. But, there, are, there isn't universal agreement on this idea. And some uh, you know, versions of the Talmudic principles here say that you, you, can, you can offer peace to, to nations if it's a voluntary war, but if it's to um, do what Joshua had to do, which was to rout out the seven Canaanite nations, you don't offer them peace. Because if you did offer them peace, they would be a thorn in your side. And in fact, the, the, the evidence in the book of Joshua, and certainly in the book of Judges, is that we didn't extirpate the land of all of its inhabitants. And we were in constant conflict with those inhabitants. But the ideal that's presented in Joshua is to eliminate the land of the inhabitants and of all of their infrastructure, especially their religious infrastructure. Um, so, you know, this is the question. This is the underlying moral question. Um, and in one way or another, I think as uh, responsible people, uh, we have to 
come to terms with you know, how we're, how we're going to understand this and how we're going to assimilate this into our view of Jewish life or Judaism. Could you just a little louder to me? Suppose we look at today. <coughs> Come on. Suppose we look at today. We've offered peace, let's say, to the Palestinians. A lot of effort on peace. And what happens next if we have war? Would it be to eliminate them all? Because they're out to eliminate us. Call it a jihad or whatever you want. Are we sort of in the same position now? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> Then you would then then you would be particularly um, concerned about Anne's question. Um, you know, for one thing, these events are contained within, shall we say, the historic past. But then the question is, does this pertain to, to the present? Does this relate in any way to the present? I have sometimes a terrible, terrible um, thought <coughs> uh, when I read about or listen <coughs> to what's going on in Syria. If I start off with the assumption, and I could be wrong about this, that virtually every Syrian hates Israel, with this would have been educated hate Israel, for whatever for the reason. So as they turn off, they are reducing the number of enemies to Israel. Now, it's a terrible thing mm -hmm. to think. And yet, I wonder if there's some truth to that. And I have a, a kind of belief that if you bring up the population to believe that this group is different than it's been needed, and we will fight to the death, and we will not compromise by a millimeter, and we will try to show them off for that, and that way of thinking applies not just over there, but applies to your neighbor who may be Shia or Sunni or Alawite or what have you. And it, it almost becomes like a logical uh, extension of the way of thinking the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and yet that's there, what I see. Right. And there's some serious. experiences that we've had recently that seem to make this um, this approach kind of normal. Did you see the, um, you know, read the book, I see the movie, oh no, I forgot the, the name of it, but it was um, based on a book by Nahama Tech, um, this book about the communities that were defiance. Mm -hmm. And when there, when there were, you know, um, the, you know the, the head of the group, what was his name? Bielski. Bielski. He had no compunction about killing any peasant, anybody around, and if you put, you know, if there's a Gentile in, in uh, Belarus, I guess this way, mm -hmm. happened. if you put yourself in that context, it seems entirely normal to protect yourself because you just, based upon experience, you just not only don't know, but you have good reason to believe that if any of those people that you come in contact with has any advantage you or a member of your family is going to be murdered. And so it's, it's, uh, it's, it's really we're not that far away from this, this kind of challenge. Okay, so it's something we, we need to really think about 
Um, and Stephanie's point really is it goes beyond the question of what we're looking at experientially because this is our sacred document. And that's a little bit different than just you know what our experiences are. And our sacred document, and this reflects something that's in the Torah, so you can't get out of it by saying, well, we read the five books, we don't read Joshua. This is our sacred document, so we do need, I think, each of us needs to come to terms with this in some way, and it's maybe an ongoing project, and hopefully you can push it out, is one way of, of, you know, of, of doing that, because you're doing it out of knowledge. So, um, and that, no, I wish everyone should have a shalom. Yeah, it is a lot.